Which players have we drafted most and which are we avoiding? We'll reveal all those names up next on a Kokomo Friday. Alcantara, Soroka, you look so good in Boca. Peralta, Manoa, Basback, Ferrer, and Nola. Gilito, Castillo, Yoshida, Mosu, Tinto, Carlo, and Fado. Now you're so high, but it ain't be so low. Frank loves him some kind of show. Now let's get on with the show. Hey! Happy Kokomo Friday and welcome in to Fantasy Baseball today on March 22nd. I am Frank Stample, joined by Scott White and Chris Towers. Today on the show, we've got ourselves a quick recap of the Dodgers Padres series in Korea. JD Martinez finally signed with the New York Mets and the players we draft most and the top fades at each position. Let's get right into this two-game series between the Dodgers and the Padres will start with game one. The Dodgers won 5-2. to Easy save for Evan Phillips. Tyler Glass now and you, Darvish, weren't at their best. Combined seven walks for both of those. I had a few people tell me the ump was pretty tight with the strike zone in that game. Glass now still had 13 swinging strikes on 77 pitches. Really a 17% swinging strike rate. Uh, Darvish's curveball was down three miles per hour compared to last year. Perhaps he's working on a slower, loopier curve. Uh, this year, but anything on Glass now on Dar- and or Darvish before we get to uh, the crazier game. game well, Chris actually woke up to watch that game, so he, I did. He, that, maybe that he was, has. Was, was the was it a tight zone for the umpire, Chris? I didn't notice it, especially one way or the other. But you know, yeah. I was a little groggy. You know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not at my I'm not at my peak at, at six fifteen in the morning. No, so no. Uh, I, I said on the podcast yesterday that. If, if I'm up at six in the morning, it's because I haven't gone to bed yet. It's not either because I'm waking up. I, I've been up at 6 a.m. twice in the last month. Yeah. Once was to catch a plane yeah. and once was to catch this game. Yeah. True story. Uh, I went to sleep the other day at 4 a.m. I woke up in the middle of the night, I, you know, when most people are just waking up in general. And I noticed, oh, it's 6 a.m. So I watched the first inning of the game. I get an email notification Scott White has made a trade in score sheet. I'm like, what is it? Scott's making trades at 6.15 in the morning. Yeah. Uh, well, I tried to catch that guy at 11, and he had already gone to bed. So, you know, I, I caught him waking up instead. It worked out. Yeah. I got Joe Boyle with that pick. The I, I didn't have much of a takeaway from this game. I think it was interesting that, you know, we've kind of assumed Yuki Matsui was maybe a setup man. For the Padres, but he pitched sixth inning, I think, in this one, yeah, which I mean, it's the, one appearance. Who knows? But and and the bullpen management from Mike Schilt was kind of crazy both games because clearly the pitchers weren't fully built up yet. Yeah. And so he kind of treated it like a uh, like a stacking exercise. Mm-hmm. So I don't know that we can take much away from that other than Robert Suarez in game two. I'm kind of skipping ahead to game two. Other than Robert Suarez in game two got the four out save, which we were expecting by now that he is the closer to begin the year. Um, but, you know, in game two, My- Michael King came out of the bullpen to pitch how many innings? Three or two? Yeah, three and a third. Mm-hmm. I don't know. My my just, you know, we're. I'm kind of bouncing between game one and game two here, which I guess is game one was kind of boring. It wasn't, there was that weird thing with uh, Jake Cronenworth's glove. That's kind of the only notable thing that actually had, except that Shohei Otani stole a base where he was safe by about 60 feet. (laughs) Mookie Betts actually stole a base in the first inning of that game and they called it back for some interference, which. Oh, it was umpire's interference. That was, yeah, that was uh, the, as the, the, I think it was the catcher clipped the umpire on the way out. So they called umpires interference. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, lot of, these lot are the details you get from waking up at six in the morning, guys. A lot of steel talk with Shohei Otani lately. I don't know <laughs> oh, if you guys gosh. have noticed. <laughs> Too soon. Um, um, I wanted to mention, though, that the, the biggest thing I noticed from the whole series is like everybody pitched poorly. Yeah. There wasn't, there wasn't a good pitching performance for as high end as these pitchers were supposed to be. And obviously, the one that stands out most for pitching poorly was Yoshinobu Yamamoto in his major league debut. Yeah. Lasted only an inning, gave up five runs. Command was 
awful. Very Not as advertised. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, four hits allowed, one walk, one hit by pitch, five earned runs. The final score of that game, by the way, the Padres won 15 to 11. So an absolute slobber knocker. We had four hit games for each of Mookie Betts, Will Smith, Jake Cronenworth, Andy Machado hit his first home run. Jackson Merrill picked up his first two uh, career hits. But yeah, back to uh, Yamamoto. He threw 40 pitches to get through one inning. Yep. It was a four pitch mix, 33% on the fastball, 26% cutter. 23% curve, 19% splitter. He averaged 95.4 miles per hour on the fastball. His cutter and splitter combined for zero called strikes. The splitter did not get a single whiff. His average exit velocity against 100.7 miles per hour. So this comes after two rough spring outings too. Any concern or do you buy the dip and drive? All right, all right. So the spring outings, I, I, I watched, I think, both of the, the poor spring outings for Yamamoto. And it was very different than this. The first one was a lot of weird defensive miscues. I think both Max Muncy and Gavin. That, that, was the, that was the game that lost Gavin Lux's shortstop job, if you remember. Um, and the second one, he was cruising for the first like three innings. And then he kind of got Babbitt to death. Uh, I think in the third or fourth inning, it was like four straight soft hit balls to right field. And then he got hit a little harder. So it was very different from this one. I, I do think like from watching him, command has been a problem for Yamamoto. I, I think was, there's also been some it sequencing was issues. supposed to be his biggest yeah. strength, command. Yeah. Like he um, was getting compared to George Kirby. As far I, as that goes, I think the stuff looks really good still. Yeah. And I, I mean, look, I even watched a couple of the strikeouts from yesterday's game and it looked the pitches look great. The, yeah. the individual pitches. He is. I think the thing to keep in mind is it's a different baseball. <laughs> like literally he is using a different baseball than the one in the, they use in Japan. The one they use in Japan is a little bit smaller. I think the seams are slightly lower. And the, are they're, the higher, seems, or, they're higher in Japan. It, it, it's stickier. They're, they're able to get more spin. Yes, they but, have. And, and they also have it pre-tacked, which is what yeah. MLB used in the Southern League last year as an experiment. And I mm -hmm. think we'll see MLB make that switch in the next couple of years. And it'll be interesting to see what the results of that are. But yeah, it's to say that like last year, Kodai Senga did not pitch in the World Baseball Classic specifically so he could get used to throwing the major league baseball yeah. baseball. And so I, I think, remember last year, Kodai Senga was not great to open to the out. season, but he and, had, but he command was supposed to be an issue yes. for him. Unlike Yamamoto. We did see Yamamoto use the MLB ball in the world baseball classic last yes. year and it went well. So I trust he'll come around to it eventually. What he actually said after that start was he wasn't able to execute from the stretch that the exact quote, I wasn't able to execute a pitch from the stretch. I know how to fix it. Mm -hmm. So I think I think a big, I think part of what happened to him, and going back to what I was saying earlier, what seemed to afflict all the pitchers on both sides was just that they're not quite there yet. In, yeah. in turn, I mean they're they're playing more than a week before everybody else, and they just haven't gotten uh, to midseason form yet. It, they're still kind still... of in spring training mode. And, it still felt like spring training. And it's especially so in, in Yamamoto's case because he has so much new to get used to. Mm -hmm. And so I buy the dip to finally get around to answering your question, Frank. This might be enough for me to drop it if I haven't drafted yet. And most people haven't. This might be enough for me to drop Yamamoto behind Pablo Lopez. You might see him go behind Tarek Skubal too, though I don't think I'd do that as much as I love Skubal. So I'm I'm not really uh, downgrading Yamamoto yeah. much at all based on this. I, I haven't really considered moving him down yet. But I also, spoiler alert for what we're going to talk about later, I haven't drafted him yet either. I think I have one share. And I have two NFBC drafts this weekend. And if there's any kind of discount, I definitely will be looking to buy the dip on Yamamoto. Uh, Joe Musgrove on the other side. Not great either. Two and two-thirds innings, five runs allowed, only two strikeouts. Velocity was fine. I think that's good to see coming back from the mm -hmm. shoulder injury last year. He leaned on his breaking pitches, which is exactly what he's done since joining the Padres what, three years ago now at this point. Uh, Michael King pitched in relief, three and a third innings, three runs allowed, three walks, five strikeouts. Sinker velocity was down 1.2 miles per hour. He averaged 92.8 compared to 94 miles per hour last year. I think that's something to watch early in the season. Mm -hmm. 
And he also threw a new curveball 20% of the time and a new cutter 7%. Definitely gave up some hard contact, but uh, yeah, some velocity and some new pitches for Michael King will be something to watch for him. Curveball had very good results. Cutter, not so much, but the curveball, four swings and misses on seven swings. Um, two caught strikes, called strikes as well, so 40% CSW. I still don't get that right. <laughs> called strike plus whiff. Yes, CSW yeah. percentage. Yeah. I, I, I got to say, though, and, and my, am I interrupting your point, Chris? No, 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 no. I just uh, the curveball for being a new pitch looked pretty effective. I got to say... I got, we did a mock draft tonight. So after this series in Korea, and mm -hmm. I took Michael King 155th overall, I hadn't taken him yet in any draft. It just seemed like he was there much later than usual. Doesn't that sound later than usual for King 155? I think so. I think he's usually so, in 120, 130 range. I, I can't help but think that rough outing had something to do with it, which mm -hmm. I, I, so I guess keep an eye on that in your drafts. If, yeah. if uh, any of those pitchers who underachieved in Korea, if, if they slide, 15 to 20 spots that you should probably take advantage. Yeah, I'm I'm doing a slow draft and he went 102nd. It was a head to head points league, but it may have just been a fluky yeah. thing. Yeah. But no, the, but that was before the start. Oh, okay. okay. So, yeah. A few quick lineup notes from uh, mostly the Padres side of things. Tyler Wade started both games at third base for the Padres, which I right, didn't really see that coming. We thought maybe it would be Grand Pauly. He does have some speed for those who play in deeper NL only leagues. Uh, and it looks like Xander Bogarts will lead off for them, followed by Fernando Tatis, Jake Cronenworth, Manny Machado, and ha -Sung Kim. Wonder if Kim batting fifth, maybe he doesn't run as much as he did last year, but that's just... He he did steal yes. a base without yes, the benefit of a hit. I don't think he had a hit. Yeah, he didn't have a hit. He walked. And I, I think the thing to keep in mind about this Padres lineup is the top five is actually pretty strong. Yeah. It's pretty bad after that. <laughs> well, you got uh, Merrill. You got Jackson Merrill. Down yeah, I mean, that's the he thing. Almost you, did a need, home run. you need Jackson Merrill to uh to really live up to expectations. And honestly, like give Grand Polly a chance. We Tyler Wade, come on. Yeah, let's get Jackson Merrill up to the sixth spot too. That that would yeah. that would be fun. Get Jackson Merrill at six and then uh Luis Campusano at seven. I, I think that would be a pretty good top seven for them. Anyway, we've got to move on. Uh, quick things to promote. Subscribe to the FBT newsletter if you haven't already. Scan the QR code if you're watching on YouTube or head to cbsports.com slash newsletters. You click on the FBT logo, punch in your email address. It's easy as that. Hard. And it's free. And <laughs> I couldn't tell what you were doing at first, Chris. <laughs> there you go. For those watching, you can see Chris presenting the QR code to you. Uh, and this is pretty cool. We finally made it. We're making a jump to television but don't mm. worry our regular youtube and audio programming won't be going anywhere this upcoming wednesday march 27th at 2 p.m eastern you'll be able to watch fantasy baseball today on the cbs sports network the same show as you know it just on tv so help support the show by tuning in live you can also watch live on the cbs sports app through your cable provider let's take a our first break when we return some quick news and then into the players we're drafting most right after this. The blackout mystery. Welcome to March Madness. Oh, oh, you just never know in the tournament who is going to shine. Stream March Madness live on any device, anywhere, and be ready for anything. Welcome back in. Let's talk some news and notes. J.D. Martinez signed a one-year, $12 million deal with the New York Mets, and it was a big bounce-back season for him last year with the Dodgers, where he hit 271 with 33 homers, 103 RBI in just 113 games. He got back to crushing the baseball. 93.4 average exit velocity was a career high. It ranked in the 98th percentile. Obviously, this is a big downgrade in terms of ballpark and team context, but for where he's been going, J.D. Martinez, over the past week, his NFBC ADP is 285.9. Scott, my guess is that's going to climb quite a bit now that he's signed with the team. Uh, we just did a mock draft tonight, and J.D. Martinez went 175th overall. So I don't know if it'll yeah. really be 100 spots higher than ADP, but he will move up. I Obviously, when we're, when we're uh, reducing, we're looking at ADP over a shorter stretch of time. We can only do that in NFBC, and I feel like NFBC is most reactive to this kind of stuff. So I, in our own drafts, I wasn't seeing J.D. Martinez last to 280, uh -huh. you know? 
Uh, it was more like 225, which, you know, 175 in our mock tonight is still a 50 spot jump over 225. I, I think that's about the earliest I'd go for him. It's still a tough fit to get a utility only player in there. I still prefer like Eloy Jimenez and Byron Buxton to JD Martinez. Um, it's, you know, I've made the point before with him that uh, his 162 game pace with the Dodgers last season, JD Martinez was uh, 47 like homers, 55 RBI or something, 148. Yeah, yeah. Uh, crazy, crazy numbers. A lot of that had to do with playing for the Dodgers. I mean, batting cleanup for the Mets behind a Pete Alonso and, and and Francisco Lindor. That that you know, and and Brandon Nimmo for that matter. Uh, that should lead to quality RBI opportunities. But what does get lost in the bounce back season for JD Martinez is that his strikeout rate ballooned. It was over thirty one percent, and normally in his career he's been under twenty five percent. And so there's a degree of Perf- just per- like not trusting the performance in mm-hmm. addition to him not being in the Dodgers lineup anymore. And he's not a young guy and he's signing late without any kind of spring training. And there's a chance this just doesn't really go anywhere. And had two IL since last year as well. Yeah. I'm not saying I want to draft him around pick 200 or maybe even 180. I, I think that's fine value, but you know, there's, He's not going to be as good as last year. I feel pretty confident saying that. I will say this. Obviously, it's not the Dodgers lineup. Mm. The Mets lineup's kind of interesting, though. I was just looking at it, and I had the same thought. It's not like, terrible. Like The top four, certainly not. The weakest spot is Harrison Bader, but he's average-ish. If Starling Marte bounces back, you know, like this, this lineup's got some potential to be pretty interesting. I think so too, man. Like Francisco Alvarez showed some pop last year. I, I think it makes more sense for him to bat fifth than someone like Jeff McNeil. I'm yeah. just looking at roster resource right now, but yeah, like Nimmo, Lindor, Alonzo, the back half. If Marte could bounce back, you know, Jeff McNeil puts the ball in play. Alvarez, Beatty, post hype sleeper. It's, it's a kind of sneaky lineup. So we'll yeah. see what New York Mets can do. And Beatty's heating up. I think he's got three home runs in his last three games. Okay, something like that. So. I was starting to have a, a little trouble getting hopeful about one of my sleepers, but he's uh, he's showing some signs of late. All right. Fabian Ardaya of The Athletic reports that Shohei Otani is not currently facing discipline, nor is he believed to be under an active investigation by the league. That's in relation to his longtime interpreter being fired by the Dodgers on Wednesday following accusations of, quote, massive theft. Kevin Gosman is expected to throw 60 to 65 pitches on Monday, which might be enough to convince the Blue Jays he doesn't need to begin the season on the IL. If you're drafting this weekend, who would you rather take a shot on? Kevin Gosman or Yamamoto? Yamamoto. Chris? Mm, I might still have Gosman ahead without having moved Yamamoto down. Let me check. No, I do have Yamamoto. I mean, it's two spots in the overall ranking, so it wouldn't take much to move Yamamoto ahead, but I would take Yamamoto. All right. Next up, both David Bednar and Kenley Jansen made their returns on a Thursday. Bednar allowed two hits but struck out one. I was watching that appearance. Velocity looked fine. He mostly looked like David Bednar. So assuming he bounces back well over the next next couple of days, I just think David Bednar will be ready for opening day. And Kenley Jansen struck out two over a perfect inning, and I would say that, same thing for him. If his body bounces back, all right, uh, ready to go on opening day. Someone who probably will not be ready on opening day, Jordan Romano, has yet to resume throwing. He was shut down earlier this week due to right elbow inflammation. Sonny Gray could make his season debut during the Cardinals' season opening road trip, which runs from March 28th through April 3rd. Sonny Gray will pitch two innings in a minor league game on Friday. Kodai Sengal will oh, be- Wait, Romano what? is hoping to throw this weekend. Okay. So there is still a little bit of hope that he could be ready for opening day. But it, like you said, it's probably unlikely. And actually, I saw a quote from John Schneider that mentioned specifically Nate Pearson, Zach Pop, and Brendan Little as options to fill in at closer for the Blue Jays if they have an opportunity. So that was kind of interesting. If I read it correctly, Chris, I think it was just those names were mentioned to fill in in the bullpen. Mm-hmm. And then when they asked specifically about saves or closing out games, 
that's when he mentioned Yimmy Garcia and Chad. Okay. But All I could right. I could be yeah, my my point. reading comprehension is not great. The big promotion for Zach Pop there. I would I would I think I would trust your reading over mine, Chris. Uh Kota Senga will begin throwing within the next week. Tim Haley of Newsday reports that Senga's ramp up will likely take at least six weeks. So a May return seems plausible if there are no setbacks for Kodai Senga. He, he's been medically cleared, though. Yep. That, that's the, the the big news there is that all the imaging has come back completely negative now. This one came out late on Wednesday night, but the Rangers signed Michael Lorenzen to a one-year $4.5 million deal. And Chris, no. is this the end for Cody Bradford? Zero concerns about <laughs> Cody Bradford. $4.5 million is nothing. No, I look, Cody Bradford is a... a uh, I can't even call him a lottery ticket because I don't think he's that good. He's just a spark. <laughs> he's just like, I'm not drafting him in Roto Leagues. It's true. literally just as a spark for like to start streaming and stuff. So you, if he falls out of the rotation in a month, it's probably because he's not that good. Yeah. If Yeah. That's, that's but he true. might be good. I know. We're mostly <laughs> saying this in jest with uh, Cody Bradford. Scott, do you have any deep league interest in Michael Lorenzen? Not especially uh, you, you get in a deep enough league and I'm in several of these leagues. Anybody with a rotation spot has value, but I'm not, I'm not uh, structuring an NL only league plan around him or anything. He's just somebody who might fall to me because he's cheap. Well, you, you can't, Structure and NL only play. AL right? only. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Good well. catch. All good. All good. Uh, stop me if you've heard this before. Eloy Jimenez was diagnosed with a right foot contusion. Apparently, he fouled the ball off of his foot and is day to day. Please, please be okay, Eloy Jimenez. Uh, stop. Uh, nope. I already read that one. Bowden Francis was informed Thursday that he's made the Blue Jays rotation and has had a solid spring 338 ERA, 15 strikeouts to four walks over 18 and two thirds innings. He is RP eligible. Yeah, that's the that I, I kind of feel like that's the spark you should have been going for, Chris Bowden eh, Francis. Eh, maybe I, I think he's got. I think he, I said this the other day. I think he's got Tyler Wells upside, good control, high fly ball rate without a lot of damage being done on the fly balls. Uh, kind of interesting there. Still on the lower end as far as sparks go. Like I would take Garrett Crochet over Bowden Francis, but yeah, but I I do think Bowden Francis in deep enough leagues has some. Late round appeal. Sure. Alec, Alec Marsh has been named to the Royals rotation, and he got knocked around a bit here on Thursday. Has had a solid spring. Uh, his career, 569 ERA, 156 whip, but does get whiffs. 12.3% swinging strike rate, 10.3K per nine Man. in his career. How many pitchers have ever been fantasy relevant with a 572 minor league ERA? Not many. I mean, the stuff actually seems decent, but yeah, I I have no interest until we see some success. I yes, missed the name. Who was that? Alec Marsh. Oh, yeah. I mean, like the slider is pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. Like he's he's gotten some whiffs before. It it is <laughs> interesting that on the day the Royals named him to the job, he had by far his worst spring start. I, I noticed that with the spring stat lines today, it was like, uh. Everybody regressed to the mean. All the pitchers who had been yeah. dominating all spring got knocked around, and the ones who had struggled, like Ryan Pepio, mm -hmm. had an amazing start. So Yeah, he was really good. Yeah. Yasmani Grandal won't be cleared to run until at least next week, and it's looking good for Henry Davis's catcher eligibility. And Scott is the fantasy jinx. Jonathan Aranda will begin the season on the IL after being diagnosed with a fractured right ring finger. He's scheduled to have surgery and will likely miss the next four to I six I am so weeks. upset. Four to six weeks is what you said. Sorry, I trampled that. I was so upset when I saw that. I, I had just put out my 25 players I keep drafting article, <laughs> and he was the 25th player, Jonathan Aranda. I mean, that's that's and, pretty easy. Just I had delete to it. go in and make it. I made a change. I wanted to. I, I didn't want to reduce it to 24. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just, I, you know, because he's 26. Or he's about to turn 26. Yeah, he's pretty old. And, and I just I I just hope his opportunity doesn't pass him by because Curtis Mead goes off or something like that. I, I want to throw out one sleeper that was mentioned in the MLB.com story about this injury, which is Austin Shenton, who is MLB.com pipelines number eight prospect for the race. He's another older guy like Aranda, but also like Aranda had a massive season in the minors last year. 304 with like a 
907 OPS between double A and triple A. That's a name to watch in ton of strikeouts. Yeah, it's a name to watch in AL only. Oh, sure. Only. Austin Shenton. Austin Shenton. That's, that's spelled S H E N T O N. Like, like fantasy baseball legend Chris Shelton, but with an N instead of an L. You know, they should just promote Junior Caminero, you coward. <laughs> yes, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, anyway, let's get to those players that we draft most and the ones that we avoid most at each position. And the idea is for this to basically be your ultimate cheat sheet going into the biggest draft weekend of the spring. These are lots of names that we've talked about, but I have a feeling there are people checking into fantasy baseball podcasts late in spring here, just trying to figure out who am I drafting? Who am I avoiding? And that's exactly what we'll tell you. So I did not count the Scott White Dynasty League uh, because there are so few players uh, available in that draft. But so far, I have done 11 drafts that I'm playing out. Six include waivers or fab. Five are draft and hold leagues. So 11 leagues total. Let's start with the outfield. We always start with catcher. Eh, who cares about catcher? Let's start with the outfield, work our way backwards. Scott, the outfielders that you're drafting most, and reminder, you got to keep it moving. Got to keep it moving. Okay, Mike Trout. I'm drafting him a ton. I think he's undervalued in round four. The correction's gone too far. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's it's particularly if I don't have an outfielder by that point. I got to get one. Uh, let's see. Who am I drafting a lot of? Evan Carter. That's a recent development. I think he's going to be a great source of runs in RBI batting on the higher end of that lineup in Texas. Should get on base a lot. Not sure where the home runs and stolen bases are going to be. He might only be Christian Yelich as far as that goes, but I I think it's a great value, and I get him a lot. Jackson Chorio, of course, I've been drafting him a ton. Uh, it's going to be harder to draft him. I don't, I don't know that I'm going to get any more shares of him now that he's confirmed to be on the Major League roster, but I, I think he could have a Julio Rodriguez-type rookie season. That's obviously the upside case. But the downside case is, I don't know, 15 homers, 25 steals, still pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, love Jackson Chorio. Is that enough names? You want more? Uh, Three is probably fine, but if there okay. are any other that stand out to you, you can mention. You know, I, I will. I, I was surprised how many shares of Kyle Schwarber I had because I haven't been motivated to draft him in Roto Leagues, but I got him in salary cap drafts or auctions. And I think it makes more sense in that format. I think sometimes it's a good value because everybody's scared off by the batting average. But in that format, you can obviously be more selective about who you uh, mm -hmm. who you match up with Schwarber on the rest of your roster. You can really focus on batting average after that. And so I think that's what I've done. Plus, I like Schwarber in points leagues where the batting average doesn't hurt you. So in the right context, I, I think he is a good pick. I think it's a really good point, Scott, because in NL Labor, I, I, I don't typically target Max Muncy or these guys that could bat around 200, but I got Max Muncy because I also had Freddie Freeman and Jeff McNeil on my team, and, mm -hmm. and so I felt like I had enough batting average buffer there to take that shot on Max Muncy. Chris, outfielders that you're drafting most. What did Nick Castellanos do to everyone to make them hate him so much? And I'm asking you two specifically because I know you hate Nick Castellanos. He is my most drafted player this season, I have drafted him in five of 11 leagues uh, that I'm counting for this exercise. We don't need to get into which ones I am, and I'm not counting. I'm playing in too many leagues already. Um, you, was that a rhetorical question, or do you want me to answer that? What did I, Castellanos did? Um, I Well, I just I feel like this is a guy who has basically had one bad season in his last, what, four or five? He's been... Mm -hmm a consistent 100 RBIs, a consistent 27 to 35 home runs. He stole 11 bases last year, That's which I don't think people realize. He stole seven the year before. I think it could happen, I guess. I think Nick Castellanos is a non-zero source of stolen bases. Mike, he will so have at least he was, one. He was just bad his first year in Philadelphia. Last year, he was good, but with a surprisingly high strikeout rate for him, so I don't entirely trust it, and that's that's basically it. I'm, I'm not saying... I wouldn't take Nick Castellanos at cost, but I'm not eager to. And to be clear, like I have him ranked ahead of his ADP. I'm actually drafting him lower than his ADP. My I, I calculated my ADP for all my my guys, and my ADP for him is 105.4. His actual ADP is 100.9 in the month of March. So I'm still getting a discount. I've also got Jaron Duran, which should come as no surprise to anyone. I love Jaron Duran. I think he's got 20 homer, 40 steal potential. 100 plus run potential at the Red Sox lineup. It's 
it's possible Jaron Duran is like a top 25 player in fantasy this season. That's a realistic outcome for him. And another one where my ADP for him is lower than his actual ADP. So even though I like him a lot, it's mostly when I'm waiting on him that I get him. And then one deeper outfielder I'm drafting a lot is Max Kepler. Another guy I've talked about a lot, took a big step forward in quality of contact, had by far the best quality of contact of his career struck out a little bit more, but I think on the whole, it was a change worth making. It was super aggressive on the first pitch. And um, I, I draft Max Kepler a lot in the later rounds. Chris, I think if Jaron Duran breaks out, you should dye your hair and beard the same color as his hair. Maybe not the beard, <laughs> but maybe, <laughs> maybe I, I can. Yeah. You know what? 20 homers, 40 steals, 100 plus runs. I will bleach my hair like Jaron Duran. If anyone hasn't seen it, go check out these interviews with Jaron Duran. I mean, this guy dyed his hair like he's Hulk Hogan. He's, he's got bleach blonde hair now. It's it's awesome. Uh, he, the outfielders I'm drafting most, Seiya Suzuki, you got to come through, bud, because mm-hmm. I got you on five <laughs> different teams. And uh, yeah, I, I look, we've talked a lot about Seiya Suzuki. I think he's going to break out. He showed flashes at times, and the plate discipline is there. The power is there. I think he's fast enough to steal some bases, too. He's batting second in the Cubs lineup. Speaking of the Cubs, Ian Happ, I have on four different teams. A lot of these draft and holds that I've done are NFBC 15 teams with five outfielders. Ian Happ is just that boring. Mm -hmm. Slug him in your lineup. I usually get him as my third outfielder. You look at the plate appearances the past three years. All he does is play. He's going to give around 20 home runs and 10 steals. He's he's boring, but he just gets it done. Uh, And surprisingly, Mitch Hanniger. I have Mitch Hanniger on three teams. I like that. He's having a great spring. 13 yep. for 29. He's got four home runs. If he could just stay on the field. like Quality of contact was still pretty good last year. I think he could pop 25 home runs still. Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, in those deeper leagues, I, I do like Mitch Hanniger. Uh, We've got to move, like, a lot faster. So, outfielder that you're avoiding most, maybe just give me some names. Somebody else go first. I So, like, I haven't drafted Michael Harris. I don't think that means I'm avoiding him, but I, I get like Cody Bellinger. This is kind of my bus pick, but I, I think I've drafted Cody Bellinger once and I haven't Michael Harris. So I think for me with Michael Harris, it's just as much as I like him as a player, I think someone's always a lot more excited about him. And I think there are still limitations to what he's likely to do. Mm-hmm. For, uh, for me, I'll give out three names. Corbin Carroll talks a lot about it this. Offer. I haven't drafted him yet either. He goes in the top five picks, and uh, I just have him ranked lower than that. I'm more worried about the shoulder than other people are. Luis Robert, I think there are just too many risk factors for a third-round pick. The health, the team context, the plate discipline, and Essary Ruiz, he's speed only, and I think there's risk of him losing playing time throughout the years. The funny thing about Luis Robert, I also haven't drafted him, but I'm, I'm higher on him than you guys are, but he had like a grade two knee sprain, I think but it was like two weeks before the end of the season. So he only missed like the last 12 games and it didn't really matter if that had happened in April, he might've missed like a month and a half and we'd be drafting him 50 spots later, even if he was the same yeah. player. Well, I, yeah, I, I co-signed to the Luis Robert, not drafting him because I would rather wait around to get Mike Trout. Cause I, I don't feel like the injury risk is that different. And I think Trout on a per game basis is going to be much better. Um, so yeah, no, no Luis Robert for me. I, yeah, you have to twist my arm to draft jazz Chisholm. He's come up a couple times and been my highest ranked player. And I just (laughs) try to talk myself into anybody else. Um, who else? How about, uh, estuary Ruiz? (laughs) The Castellanos. (laughs) I don't want to, estuary Ruiz is too hard to build around. I mean, I understand there are, you may be that desperate for steals, but I try not to be. Mm -hmm. All right, let's take our final break. When we return, the rest of the players we're targeting and avoiding right after this. Two big boys getting ready to play. Big being the operative word here. And here they come. All right, let's get into the shortstop that we are drafting most. And Chris, why don't you kick us off here? Surprisingly, Bo Bichette. I have drafted Boba Shett in four of my 11 leagues. I think a bounce back in his stolen base production is likely. I think that lineup will be better than it was last year. I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in on Boba Shett. But again, my ADP for him is 50.8. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that- I'm getting him really late when I'm drafting him. Scott, shortstop, you are drafting most. 
Jackson Holiday is up there for me. Uh, he's even though he's the consensus number one overall prospect, he's not getting nearly the the hype that Wyatt Langford and Jackson Chorio are. I don't feel confident his power is as developed, but with mm-hmm. players with that pedigree can progress quickly. Yes. And he does enough other things well that I think outside the top 120, he's great. Plus, it's just like the way shortstop breaks down. Uh, once you get Xander Bogarts off the board, in deeper leagues, I'd say once Dansby Swanson is off the board too, there's just not a lot more I, I'm interested in. And I think I think Jackson Holiday is the most is the upside play that I feel most comfortable with actually. So I, I end up with them a lot. Also drafting a lot of like Jackson Merrill and Tim Anderson really late mm-hmm. in, in deeper roto leagues. All right. Uh, probably the p- position that's most spread out for me is, is shortstop because there are many different skill sets. I, I believe at shortstop and it really just depends on what you need throughout the draft, but Xander Bogarts and Trevor story are two players that I have on multiple teams already. Bogarts isn't really a target, but, just no one seems to want him. Nobody and- wants him. Nobody wants the guy who went 1919 last and- year and is hitting leadoff in a top heavy lineup. Look, he's hitting leadoff with Fernando Tatis and Manny Machado yeah. behind him. Like that's that's still pretty good. Uh and Trevor Story is having a great spring. Talked a lot about him. I, I think he's gonna go 2020 this year. Mm-hmm. The batting average, probably somewhere between 230 and, and 250. Uh, but I have been prioritizing batting average early in drafts. And then I could go ahead and take someone like Trevor Story a little bit later on. Give me a shortstop name that you guys are avoiding. Anthony Volpe. Okay. Like I, I saw his home run yesterday, this like new swing, and it was like the wimpiest home run I've ever seen in my life. Oh, come on. It might have gone out in Yankee Stadium because he hit it to right field, but it was like 316 feet. It was they, they used to I say have, the same thing about Mookie Betts, Chris. I have no faith in Anthony Volpe. Okay. That's fine. I, I, I he's being overdrafted. Uh Bo Bichette. <laughs> That's why Chris keeps drafting. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I did. Scott get and I are in- constantly yelling at each other off the air. By the way, this this witty repartee between us fully a a thing for the cameras. But when the cameras are off, we're fighting nonstop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we're not. Um, but <laughs> but Bo Bichette is uh yeah i i just i just don't trust that the pa- like they have it hasn't been there the past couple of years the power mm-hmm. or speed to justify the pick the batting average is should be good maybe he bounces back with the stolen bases but you know i don't feel confident in that i did get him in one like salary cap situation where he just was the perfect fit for my team but in drafts it's never at the point in the draft where he goes it's just like i'm never looking his way the shortstop that i've been avoiding ellie de la cruz in the third round though I'm starting to feel more and more like I'm going to regret that, but uh, we'll see. Obviously, he's a pretty polarizing player. Third baseman that you are drafting most, Scott, you're up first. Okay. Oh, I can say this with authority. It's Alex Bregman. Alex Bregman. So I counted up my 11 teams, and there are only three players who are on five of the 11 teams. And Alex Bregman is one of them. He's the highest end of the three players on five of my teams. And... I think the reason for that is, one, he's my plan A at, in head-to-head points leagues at third base. I don't think Austin Riley and Rafael Devers are worth the cost in that format. I think Bregman's just as good, and you can usually get him around, if not two, later. Uh, my plan B, by the way, is Max Muncy, but I haven't had to resort to plan B very much. And the second reason I think I'm getting a lot of Alex Bregman is I like his cost in Roto Leagues, too, because that's you know like round seven, round eight. He's one of the best bets for running RBI production at that point. Mm-hmm. And, and it, those are maybe the two most difficult categories. Batting average, you could talk about that too. But runs and RBIs, it's hard to make up ground of those categories mm-hmm. later in roto drafts. That, that's really the studs domain. And Bregman is, is there a lot later to, to help with that. Chris, the third baseman that you are drafting most. I thought Scott and I would actually be in agreement on this one, and I'm disappointed that he hasn't drafted Cabrian Hayes more. I haven't drafted him once. I know I'm kind of disappointed. Because I too. have him in four of my leagues. <laughs> and, I mean, we've talked a ton about Cabrian Hayes, the changes he made after coming back from the IL last season, the the work he put in when he was in the minors on his rehab assignment, added a, added a leg lift, added a leg kick on his swing, 
started driving the ball to the, the pull side in the air more often. He is having a bonker spring. He's hitting 415. He's got two strikeouts and 42 plate appearances with three home runs. I think I think we're finally going to get the Brian Hayes season. I think 25 and, and 10 is not the floor, but it's kind of my expectation at this point. There are three third basemen that I have on two of my teams, and uh, Austin Riley is one of them, Jake Berger, and Jamer Candelario. So it's very clearly, I'm trying to get Austin Riley in the second round if I can, and if I miss out on that, then I'm waiting for one of Jake Berger or Jamer Candelario as a fallback option. Yeah, I got some Berger too, of course. One of the players I love, though not so much in points leagues. I think that's probably worth stressing because sometimes that message gets lost in all the... All the uh, love, effusive praise, yes. <laughs> what about a third baseman that you are avoiding? Chris, up first. I haven't drafted Austin Riley. I can't say I'm avoiding him. If I'm avoiding anyone, it doesn't feel good because I love him. Manny Machado, I just... Hmm. And he crushed a home run today, so you know, who knows? But I, I just... The fact that he's like had multiple setbacks seemingly with this recovery from elbow surgery, it just it's a little scary, right? Like a guy who's... DH only for the start of the season because he can't throw. That just, it feels like things could go wrong. Scott? In a major turn of events from last year, I think it's actually Nolan Arenado. Not because I think there's anything wrong with Nolan Arenado. I just am that confident in Jake Berger. I I think by the five by five categories, at least, mm-hmm. I think he's going to be better than Arenado. I think he's going to hit more home runs with a similar batting average and more home runs could potentially mean more RBI, even though he's in a worse lineup. I, I also think Josh Young might be better than Nolan Arenado and goes later. So uh, yeah, I, I had a chance to draft him in that, take him in that draft tonight at cost. And I just couldn't bring myself to do it knowing the third base options that would be there later. All right, the third baseman that I've been avoiding is Royce Lewis. Just don't want to use a top 60 pick on a player that hasn't proved that he could stay on the field yet. Although I will admit he is... We're drafting him next week. We're we're getting him. Immensely talented. There is no doubt about that. Can Royce Lewis stay on the field? I'm not willing to pay a top 60 pick to find out. Second baseman that we are drafting most. And Scott, we will start with you. Okay, because I'm very prepared to give an answer. And <laughs> Maybe oh, it's, it's, start with Chris. <laughs> it's Jose Altuve. Uh, Jose Altuve is one of them anyway. Uh, I, I think because I make it a high priority to draft one of the high-end second basemen in round three, and I rank Altuve the highest of those three second basemen for both formats. He had clearly the best points per game last year, and he is the best bet for batting average between him, Marcus Simeon, and Ozzy Albies. And I think I'm alone in ranking him the 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 best of those threes, which is why I keep ending up with him. Uh, I also want to may, uh, put in a word here for Nico Horner in a similar vein to Kyle Schwarber, where I think if you've been listening to us throughout the preseason, I tell you, yeah, I think, I think Nico Horner's overvalued. I don't think he deserves to go that much higher in drafts than like Bryson Stott and Andres Jimenez and all them. And I think that's true. But again, salary cap scenario is different. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know. I, I, I think I've, I've found that the cost has been more reasonable than what you see in a draft. And Nico Horner is actually kind of the perfect pairing for Kyle Schwarber. So I think I've ended up with a, more shares of Nico Horner than I expected because I ended up with more shares of Kyle Schwarber than I expected. And also like Schwarber, Nico Horner might be even more valuable in points leagues than categories mm-hmm. leagues because the one deficiency, the home runs doesn't hurt you as much in points leagues. It, what, it The sum of his contributions still adds up to a lot of points. Um, it, yeah, that's, that's basically the case. I think people think, oh, Nico Horner, base dealer, batting average, that's a categories guy, but it's so many stolen bases and s- the, such a low strikeout rate is – his head-to-head points per game production was significantly better than like the Bryson Stotts and Andres Jimenez's of the world. Chris, second base that you second baseman you're drafting most. Uh, nobody. This is a weird thing about the the eleven drafts that I'm talking about here. Is there is not a single second baseman that I have drafted more than twice. The three second basemen I drafted twice are Glaber Torres, Catal Marte, and Gavin Lux. Super late. So I guess those are my answers. I thought it would be Brandon Lau, but 
I guess it's not because I've only drafted him once. Um, I, I guess I wait too long every time for yeah, him. But that does no. happen. Like you, you get, you see a guy who's an extreme value, and you get in your head, okay, I can, wait I can wait, I can wait, I can wait. Yeah, and you wait forever, and somebody yeah. takes him out from under you. And um, but yeah, I guess the takeaway there is just second base is the position that I'm least intentional about. Okay. So I'll take. Yeah, I've got a, a ton of different guys at second base rather than one guy. I've got a bunch. I have three of each of these names. Jose Altuve, Ozzy Albies, Bryson Stott, and Tyro Estrada. So like I mentioned with third base, I am typically targeting Altuve or Albies, you know, in the third round of drafts. And then if I don't get one of those two, I I'm falling back on a Bryson Stott or even a Tyro Estra uh, Estrada a little bit later on. Second baseman that you are avoiding, Chris. So I, I said I've pretty much taken every second baseman like once. The one exception is Ozzy Albies. I have not drafted him yet. It's it's not necessarily that I'm avoiding him. I just Chris, do I don't you know hate the Braves because Michael Harris. Probably I get, does. Yeah, this well, is why we're yelling at each yeah, other. Yeah, that's kind of yeah. I mean, that was man. Yeah, Ozzy Albies. Braves Marlins rivalry. You I mean, when the Marlins ninety seven when the Marlins beat that, the Chris. Braves in ninety seven. Oh my god, that it's was so huge. Man. Levon Hernandez, great umpiring work oh, in that game. Um, no, I I just... Oh, you see I the struggle. highlights from that Levon Hernandez it's, start now. It's incredible. It's, just, it's incredible. Uh, oh. No no umpire has ever been better at their job uh, than okay. that guy. Greg something. Uh, Eric, Eric Greg? Eric Greg, there you go. Yeah. Um, Albies, I just kind of have trouble wrapping my mind around... A guy who I think is like a good but not great hitter um, that early. It's, it's mostly just that I, I think I have him ranked like three spots lower than his ADP, and he never goes later than his ADP. And I like Marcus Simeon and Jose Altuve more. So I've taken both of those guys before Albies. Scott, second baseman to avoid. I am avoiding Luis Arise. Same. And, yeah, I, I think he's going to hit 315 instead of 350, and that's going to make him pretty fringy. And, and uh, you know, I'm not saying there aren't certain roto builds where he's the right pick if you've really neglected batting average, but I haven't had such a build yet. So I've seen no value in taking Luis Arise. Although I am a fraud because I, I took Luis Arise in, in Tout Wars. So, uh, may have been the right build for it, Frank. Yeah, I, I mean, came look, close to take one of those leagues where I got Kyle Schwarber. I came close to taking Luis Arise. Yeah, I, I think was, the one league I have Arise was also a league where I had Schwarber. Yeah. And the, the, yeah, similarly, what happened was um, I knew I wanted to get Jake Berger later on, so I wanted a high OBP middle mm -hmm. infielder, and, and that's why I went and got Luis Arise. Let's move over to first base. First baseman that we are drafting most. Chris, we'll start with you this time. First baseman that I'm drafting most. Officially, it's Vladimir Guerrero, but I've only drafted him twice. That's another position where I'm not especially, um, I almost said conscious of, but yeah, whatever term I'm thinking of, I'm not going in with a conscious plan of, I'm going to get this guy. It's That's a draft where I more take what falls to me. So like Yandy Diaz is another guy I have a couple of shares of but there's nobody that I have more than two at first base. So I guess it's Vlad Jr. and Yandy Diaz, but the answer is really nobody. Conscious, conscious would have worked. Yeah, it felt weird. It felt wrong coming off the bat. I don't know. Okay. Low exit velocity. Yeah. Yep. Scott, yeah. first base. Uh, so this is another one of the three players that I have in five of my leagues is, is Vinny P, baby. Baby. Yeah. Uh, so I think I, it's just, it's weird how everybody's out on him. His ADP has been out, like he goes twice. He goes. So he was, he was probably, he was drafted about 80th overall last year. Right. Am mm -hmm. I remembering that right now? He's going like one sixtieth, And uh, I want to say Tristan Casas is a first baseman. I draft a lot because I think he has huge breakout potential and upside, but knowing Vinny Pasquantino is there. 80 picks later, 75 picks later, I just, yep. I can never pull the trigger on Casas. And I end up with all these shares of Pasquantino, who I think, I think the upside's a little lower than Casas, particularly in terms of home runs, but I think they are similar profiles. And I'm happy to take the discount on Pasquantino. Yeah, Pasquantino's ADP last year was 92.9. 
the ADP over the past week at the NFBC, Tristan Costas, 89.5. Vinny Pasquantino, 168.4. The, the value on Pasquantino is great, yeah. Yep. Uh, for me, uh, Bryce Harper and Anthony Rizzo, between you two, somebody stay healthy because <laughs> I think I have uh, three of each of those guys. Bryce Harper, who's dealing with the back injury, hoping to get in games on, on Friday. Obviously, we'll find out. If not Friday, hopefully some point this weekend. And Anthony Rizzo, before the concussion last year, he looked really good. Mm -hmm. He's hitting well in spring so far. Expected to back clean up behind Aaron Judge and Juan Soto. So I, I think there's pretty big upside there for Anthony Rizzo. First baseman that you are avoiding, Scott. Paul Goldschmidt is one I'm avoiding. He's a bust yeah. candidate for me. And I, there are just so many later first basemen I like, like Casas, like Christian Walker even, certainly like Vinny Pasquantino. Just don't see much reason to take Paul Goldschmidt. I'm looking real quick if there's anyone else. Nah. Uh, you know what? I, I haven't been that thrilled to take Vlad. I just I feel like if you're gonna take a non-base stealer that high, you gotta you gotta be sure he's gonna deliver massive numbers elsewhere. And it's hard to feel certain of that with Vlad because it hasn't happened the last two years. I think it could happen again. But I, there are other places I turn in round three. Chris, avoid at first base. I have not drafted Paul Goldschmidt. I have not drafted Spencer Steer, and I'm pretty unexcited about him. I, I'm more likely to draft him now, though. You gotta, you A gotta little admit, bit, yeah. Um, I almost took him in the mock tonight. And then I... There has, I don't think in, I don't know, 25 drafts that I've done this year counting mocks, I don't think there's been a point where I've even considered Alec Bohm. I just find him so boring. I, I, he's fine. Like, mm -hmm. he'll hit for a decent average. He'll get some RBI. But I just, ugh, he's so boring. He, he can, is. He's such he a is, great. He's a great deep league player, Chris. Yeah, sure. Yeah. He, he's like a, a nice stabilizer, but he is like the definition of a jag at this point. The first baseman that I've been avoiding, Cody Bellinger and Paul Goldschmidt. Bellinger also has outfield eligibility. It's mostly because I'm always looking for something else at that point in the draft. So those guys are going typically in round five. I draft a lot of pitchers in round five, and I just like either Bryce Harper early or I'll wait past this point and try to get Tristan Casas or like a Josh Naylor or Andy Diaz or even later than that or someone like Anthony Rizzo. So it uh, just doesn't make sense for the way that I've been building teams, Cody Bellinger and Paul Goldschmidt. Catcher that you are drafting most, Chris, up first. All right, so the actual answer is also the player I'm going to be dropping the most because I drafted Tyler <laughs> Soderstrom in five leagues and then he got <laughs> sent down to the minors. Jeez. Uh, it was all 15-team or AL-only yeah. leagues. So, And I, I will say there are three catchers that I have drafted three times each. They might have all been in the same draft. One of them's technically not catcher eligible. It's Henry Davis. But I kind of think in a two-catcher league, this is my perfect combination. I draft Mitch Garver around 180th overall. I draft Henry Davis around 200th overall. Maybe a little earlier now, the helium's starting to catch up. And then with my very last pick, either in the reserve round or if I have to take him before the reserve round, Travis Darno, whatever. I'll just cut him as soon as Henry Davis is catcher eligible. And I've got Mitch Garver and Henry Davis, and I think that is an unbeatable catcher combination for the price. I noticed today, Chris, that I have Renee Pinto on three teams, and I'm like, why do I have Renee Pinto? That's it's because those are Henry Davis teams. Yeah, you just, you just, you just got to get a, a warm body for, for six days. That's exactly right. Scott, catcher that you are drafting most. Well, in one catcher leagues, which includes the head-to-head -head points leagues primarily mm -hmm. for us, uh, it's all over the place. It's just my favorite that's there at the end of the draft, or if like, William Contreras. Is that the right Contreras? Yeah, William Contreras is like an extreme discount like mm -hmm. in the podcast league. I'll take him. So it's all over the place there. But in Roto Leagues, there are a couple that I have several shares of, and it's kind of surprising names, actually. It's Cal Raleigh, who is maybe the best bet for home runs mm -hmm. at the position and surprisingly a good source of runs in RBI. He plays a lot for the Mariners. And so if I have, if I feel like I have a good batting average base and I'm more worried about those counting stats, I'll, I'll go for Cal Raleigh. Also Alejandro Kirk. Mm -hmm. I started to gravitate toward him as a number two catcher thinking, I like this guy's top 10 last year. Uh, and you know, he could still be good for batting average. 
now now Danny Jansen's hurt. I was taking him even before that, but uh, that that gives him a chance to really uh, hopefully, you know, sink his claws into the position and and hold on to it. So I think Kirk. No reason to take him in one catcher leagues because the position is deep enough already. But in two mm-hmm. catcher leagues, he's an ideal number two, I think. Jansen could be back in mid April, though, from from what I was saying. Sure. Hopefully, Kirk's already. You mean yeah. mid mid yeah mid April mid April yeah. 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 Hopefully, Kirk's off to a hot start. Wilson Contreras, the other Contreras, not the mm-hmm. uh, the one that Scott is drafting. Uh, Wilson, I have him on five teams, so really need him to come through this year. Ooh, I have Andrew Ruiz on a few. Yeah, I, I really do. Um, I just thought he got off to a weird start last year. Yeah, absolutely. First year with the new team with the Cardinals, and and then the second half he was great. Statcast numbers are still awesome. Like he's a catcher that's probably going to hit two fifty with mm-hmm. twenty plus homers and a handful of steals, and I think that's pretty valuable. Uh, catcher that we are avoiding. I'll quickly mention Yiner Diaz. He's going forty to fifty picks uh, ahead of Wilson Contreras, and I would take Contreras straight up over Yiner Diaz. So I have just been avoiding mm. him. Uh, Chris, catcher you're avoiding. I have not drafted Adley Rutschman. I have not drafted JT Romuto. I have not drafted Will Smith, and I have not drafted Yiner Diaz. <laughs> so I guess it's all right. all those guys. Every yeah. early round catcher except for William Contreras, I guess I drafted once. Okay, Scott. I mean, I've, I'm not paying Adley Rutschman costs. Uh, I I could see the right league context if they fall enough getting somebody like Rushman or William Contreras, which mm-hmm. I did in the podcast league, or Will Smith, which I did in my home league just because it was the right setup to yeah. and the right value for a stud catcher. The the one I'm most likely to avoid and can't see myself drafting at all is JT Real Muto. I think he's on the decline. Uh, I don't think he has the plate discipline of those other guys anymore. And I don't really need whatever steals he's going to provide. And, and for what it's worth, the two times I've drafted William Contreras, he fell 20 spots below his ADP. I got him 92nd point, 92.5 as my ADP for him, so. Starting pitchers. We can probably do a whole podcast on just the <laughs> pitchers that we are drafting most. But Chris, again, we will start with you. Uh, which which starting pitchers do you wind up with? All right. I have th- two starting pitchers in four of my leagues. That's Yusei Kikuchi and Casey Mize. Super late picks. I really like the, the upside for Kikuchi, especially Mize. It's just a dart throw. It's just a lottery pick. Uh, among the earlier round pitchers, Pablo Lopez is on three of my leagues and I've actually drafted him higher than his ADP. So I guess I'm, I'm the Pablo Lopez guy and, uh, Justin Verlander. I I have on three leagues. I, I think he's probably back in mid April. He's faced live hitters for the first time this week. Sounds like he might pitch in like a minor league game towards the end of spring training. And, uh, yeah, I, th- I think Justin Verlander is going to be okay. Scott, over to you. Starting pitchers that you are drafting most. So I, I, I will say I have fewer shares of Cole Reagans than you'd believe because <laughs> I am way far ahead of the consensus on him. And yet it seems like every time I draft, somebody in the draft is on the same page with me for Reagans and takes him instead. I, I did get him in Tout Wars at least, but I wish I had a lot more Cole Reagans. So just getting that out of the way. Tarek Skubal, I have gotten a lot of him, my AL Cy Young pick. Uh, it's great when I can get him as number two, but I, I'll, I, I'd be fine with him as number one. Justin Steele, I feel like he is. I was, I was down on Justin. Famous Steele. Justin think, Steele guy, Scott White. I, I don't know what happened. Like nobody's drafting him like he was a Cy Young contender last year. That's what mm-hmm. happened. Okay, well, I, I think Justin Steele is a good pitcher. I think he's like a poor man's Max Fried, a nice stabilizing force there as mm-hmm. number three in Roto. So I'm getting him a lot. Chris Bassett. Uh, ERA is shaky and I had him in the glob originally because of that, but I think he's going to be good for everything else. Throw so many innings will be a big strikeout total. Hopefully a big win total. Good whip guy. Love getting Chris Bassett as a number four, or sometimes a number three. Uh, Mitch Keller. I have a decent amount of him. We've talked about him a lot. Oh, one of the, the, the third player who I roster in five of my leagues is Kodai Senga, who we got some good na- news today with him. Uh, all, all, the, all the times I drafted him were after the shoulder injury, so I got him very cheap, in my humble opinion. And uh, I think I'll get three quarters of the season from him as performing like a number two. So uh, I draft even more of Kodai Senga if I could, uh, and then a couple of spring risers who I've drafted a lot recently: Luis Severino, 
mm-hmm. the pitch tipping issue that the Mets discovered and appear to have fixed, judging by his spring. Got him and, on three of my teams, yep. And AJ Puck, who I, I think I was ahead of the uh, the hype on him. And I, I still think he's kind of an industry secret. I didn't I think if you're drafting with a bunch of normies, they're they're not going to be looking that hard at AJ Puck. But I mean, big strikeout numbers as a reliever. He's expanded his arsenal this spring and gotten huge strikeout numbers. Former elite pitching prospect with the A's who got moved to the bullpen because of injuries. I think this is AJ Puck's time to shine. Yeah, he went for $4 in my salary cap league earlier this week. I don't know if that's higher or lower than I would have thought. I, I think based on the hype, Later in spring, it's a 12 team league, yeah. I think that, that probably and it's sense. a keeper league, so there's a little a little inflation there. Yep, so my season is riding on these three names, these are the <laughs> ones that are going to bring me to glory, probably not. But Logan Webb, Shota Imanaga, and Aaron Savali, those each of those I have on four plus teams. I think I have Logan Webb on six teams. You Excuse always draft me. him. I mean, Logan There's Webb is. Uh, I, I I I haven't drafted Logan Webb actually because you keep doing it, but I'm I'm with <laughs> you on that one. Imanaga and, and Savali kind of feel very similar. It's just, can they avoid giving up 38 home runs? <laughs> like, I, I I really I think that's what it's going to come down to for Oof. both of those guys. Yeah, Logan Webb, man, he's had a terrible spring too. So I've I I've don't worry to, about that I've at tried all. To back off. It probably doesn't matter. Uh, I've tried to back off, but I think I wound up taking him in the in the points league listener league draft the other day. Uh, and three other names that I have on three teams: Justin Steele with you, Scott. I just he seems too undervalued. Uh, going into the Tout Wars auction last week, I, I looked at my rankings and projected auction values, and I said, "Who is the ugly duckling? Who is the one that no one wants?" And it's Justin Steele, and yeah. you're just getting him for too cheap. Uh, Jose Barrios is another one as an innings eater type, similarly to how you like Chris Bassett, Scott. Uh, and James Paxton has found his way on some, three of my teams. Um, Can I give some of the names who are on three of my teams as well? Go ahead. Uh, Chris Paddock, Reed Detmers, Nestor Cortez, Luis Severino, and Gavin Stone. They're all basically outside of the top 200 where I've taken them, but I think there's significant upside mm-hmm. with all of them. And I was really upset that I didn't get to draft Gavin Stone in a draft we did tonight that we are not playing i know i gotta get some i mean i only have one maybe two drafts left i have gotta get me some gavin stone yeah Yeah, i think think he's gonna be really good he's got a bigger glove to help stop the pitch tipping i I love that detail his glove is a half inch bigger so he's fine he's not gonna pitch tip his pitches anymore a spring riser for me that i've been drafting a lot is actually jared jones with the pirates yes absolutely he is a prospect with them. He throws extremely hard, and I think he's going to be their fifth starter. So, and he's looked really good this spring. Yep. Starting pitchers that we are avoiding. I'll quickly start us off here. Zach Gallen, just worried about him throwing 240 plus innings last year between mm-hmm. the regular and the postseason. Aaron Nola has a 446 ERA or higher two of the past three years, still being drafted as a top 12 ish starting pitcher. And Joe Ryan, issues with home runs and lack of secondary pitches. Uh, has me worried about Joe Ryan. Scott, we'll go over to you. Pitchers you are avoiding. Pitchers I'm avoiding would include uh, Max Freed, actually. I just, for the price, I need more strikeouts than that. And the Mm -hmm. volume has never really been there for Freed, and I don't expect that to change, especially coming off an injury, a a year where he was injury-plagued. I'm also avoiding Tyler Glass now. Big time volume issues there. Same. Uh, I'm also avoiding. Who else am I avoiding? I'm avoiding. Uh, Joe Ryan. Ryan. Join me. Join me, uh, Scott. Joe Ryan. Yeah, oh, definitely Joe Ryan. He's yeah. like my my most confident bust pick. But like the Bobby Millers and Grayson Rodriguez, they just go too early for me. They're yeah, I have high quality pitchers going after them. I I I like the upside in theory, but it. It's not a secret to anybody, and they're maybe being overvalued on that upside. Chris, who do you avoid outside of Tyler Glass now? So I haven't drafted Zach Wheeler, Yoshinobu Yamamoto, Kevin Gosman, or Zach Gallen, but I wouldn't say I'm avoiding them. I just, I'm not usually looking for pitchers there, or if I am, it's usually Pablo Lopez, apparently. Um, Freddie Peralta, I think, is the one I'm avoiding. His, I just, I can't justify a top 60 pick for, for a guy who, I don't think has ever thrown even 170 innings has had 
at times with problems. I just, I get it. Strikeouts are awesome. And that's the one thing he does really, really well consistently, but everything else has been very inconsistent for Freddie Peralta and there's workload concerns. I just, I can't justify the price. It's, it's kind of like Tyler glass now, except, you know, a little cheaper. Yeah. I think he's typically going two rounds later, right? Yeah. Glass now at the mm-hmm. three, four turn. I usually yep. see uh, Freddie Peralta mostly in the fifth round. I, I, I have drafts. I'm mostly just avoiding pitcher in that range. Anyway, is really what it comes down to. Okay. Let's wrap up with the rel- relief pitchers and uh, just give me names. So we don't have to really get into analysis here, but uh, just give me the relievers that you guys find yourself drafting most. You Jose. are muted, Chris. Oh, darn. I was going to jump in there with yeah, Jose LeClerc and more recently Robert Suarez. I've been taking him over LeClerc now that he has a save. He's the only well, one of two pitchers, I guess, with a save. <laughs> I don't know that he'll be discounted anymore. Oh, I'm, I'm, an, I'm analyzing. You told me not to. Yeah, those How two, great. Robert Suarez and Jose LeClerc. <laughs> Chris? Uh, I have Kenley Jansen and David Bednar in uh, – Three leagues, so I guess I love lat injuries, and I have Carlos Estevez in two. So, yeah. All right, Rysel Iglesias I have on three teams, and then I have each of Paul Sewald, Carlos Estevez, and Will Smith on two teams. The relief pitcher that I've been avoiding most, Alexis Diaz. Issues yep, with same. control last year, velocity was down, bad ballpark to pitch in. Scott, reliever you're avoiding. Any... One who goes ahead of Paul Seawald, <laughs> basically. <laughs> All right. I just, I, I, there have been occasions where I've taken somebody from that group, but I'm not being that selective about who I get. It's just if it's such a great value that I can't pass it up, then, you know, I might take a Camilo Duvall or uh, there was one draft where I took Josh Hader just because nobody was willing to take a closer for like seven rounds, but that's, that's rare. Chris? Alexis Diaz, I'm right there with you on that one, and Tanner Scott. Oh yeah, I wrote him up in Bus 2.0. So yeah, his, his last three outings have been better for what yeah, he's, he's looked he, better, he have, but he may have fixed his issue. He's got a long track record of not throwing strikes, and I just and, and like it's not like oh he walks four per nine. Tanner Scott was like six before last year was like six seven per nine. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I. I think there are a lot of ways that things can go very wrong for him. All right. Good luck to everybody in your drafts this weekend. And we are going to wrap there for Scott and Chris. I am Frank. Thanks as always for tuning in to fantasy baseball today. Please make sure to follow and leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. And we will be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye. Oh, Mason Miller. Ah.